Hello, I'm Claire Cowan, Director of Program Design and Delivery with Slipstream. And I'm Scott Hackle, Director of Research and Innovation with Slipstream. So Slipstream has been working to advance superior energy performance in commercial buildings through the integration of control systems across multiple building systems. Today, we're going to be sharing results and lessons learned from our research in this area. And really, the foundation of this work is a demonstration project in Minnesota that we completed earlier this year. The question that we're really trying to answer is what will it take to spur the market to go beyond a basic LED retrofit and optimize energy efficiency by installing an advanced lighting system, then leveraging that system to improve control of other building systems. So the demonstration in Minnesota gave us insights into what's involved in these kinds of retrofits and controls integration projects. What does it cost and what does it save? And what are the barriers and how can we address them? Ultimately trying to answer, is there a viable pathway for future energy efficiency program development? The Minnesota demonstration was funded by US Department of Energy and supported by Excel Energy. Cree and Legrand manufactured the lighting and plug load control products that we used in this research. And then Excel Energy helped us identify the sites and provided incentives. Pacific Northwest National Lab led the measurement and verification work, which quantified the energy savings impacts. Over to you, Scott. So the um, basis of the need for this pilot is the fact that the traditional energy efficiency program these days has been built on a backbone of simple uh, lighting retrofits. Um, you know, today's lighting retrofit is a one for one LED fixture swap out or even a LED lamp replacement. Um, these retrofits can save about 50% of lighting energy, which is fantastic. It's a great reduction in lighting energy, but lighting is a um, decreasing percentage of overall building energy as other loads in the building become more prominent. And so these retrofits are only yielding three to 8% of total building energy savings. Um, so we're leaving a lot of energy savings on the table. Um, especially considering the fact that these uh, lighting retrofits could be a great jumping off point to um, more uh, retrofit opportunities. Next slide. A couple of advancements in lighting controls um, lead to the potential to expand well beyond these simple one for one uh, lighting fixture retrofits and do more with controls in the building. Um, and I'll speak about lighting controls first, but you'll see quickly that this expands to controls of other systems as well. Um, one of the key innovations has been the prominence of luminaire level lighting controls. And you can see an example uh, photo of one of these fixtures in the lower right. This is a simple two by two trough or fixture. And on the far right um, in the middle there, you can see two small circles. Those are sensors. One is an occupancy sensor and one is a photo sensor. And we can use these to now to um, control the lights at a very granular level. Um, so we're only using the amount of light we need in spaces where there are people. But we can use this occupancy information for other things. Next slide. Once we have a very granular uh, occupancy sensor network, um, which given that this is part of a lighting fixture, it's going to cover the entire building and it's going to be um, granular to the extent of probably every eight feet or so, there's going to be one of these sensors. We can begin to control thing, everything from the plug loads in individual workstations to common area plug loads to the HVAC terminal units within each zone, zone on a zone by zone basis. This unlocks a lot of additional energy savings in these other uh, systems and creates a much more holistic retrofit um, that leaves a lot less on the table um, uh, stranded in that building once the utility program or whatever program it is moves on. Um, next slide. <clears throat> so in our in our pilot, we conducted um, exactly that in five different buildings. We controlled um, lighting, we controlled plug loads, and we controlled HVAC uh, units in five different buildings of a variety of space types. Here you can just see two examples. 
there's a pharmacy in the lower left, and then we have a break room in an office in a um, uh, public works office on the on the right. Um, we also uh, controlled a number of other types of spaces from fitness areas to um, to offices to clinic spaces, uh, and all were all were capable of being controlled with this package. Next slide. To get a little bit more specific into how we're saving energy with each of those systems, um, we've got a table here of the different measures that we're able to implement once we have this uh, sensor data. So um, the lighting savings we've kind of already talked a little bit about. Um, in addition to occupancy and daylight control though, using those sensors, um, it's worth noting that we actually get a substantial amount of uh, lighting savings from task tuning. Uh, we're able to, with this type of light fixture, um, tune the lighting within each zone or even within each fixture, though more often we did it zone by zone, to exactly the amount of light that's needed for whatever task is happening in that zone um, on an ongoing basis all the time, not just when uh, it's daylight out. But let's spend more time talking about the other systems. So on the HVAC side, once we have um, occupancy control, the sort of more, most obvious thing you might want to do is set back the thermostat when people aren't in the room. So we, we kind of experimented. We felt found that you could set thermostats back by three degrees uh, in general, and in some cases, even four degrees when people would leave the room. But you can do a lot more than that. Um, I think maybe one of the biggest measures here is if your HVAC system is a VAV system, you can turn down the flow through a VAV box considerably. And in a lot of cases, we turned it completely off. So now you're eliminating a lot of airflow and reheat. You can also do more aggressive pressure and temperature resets in the overall system. So now we're starting to impact the air handling, air handling unit itself. And then you can control ventilation using demand control in a couple different ways. Um, that one depends a little bit on the capabilities of your ventilation system though. And then moving on to plug loads, again, we were able to turn on and off individual workstation devices as well as some common area equipment. Next slide. All right, so I'm going to talk about some of the results that we found from three of the five sites where we have final energy savings data. So on average, across the three sites, we saw a 67% reduction in lighting energy use and a 47% reduction in HVAC use. And as you can see, in terms of the overall savings per square foot, the HVAC control strategies represented nearly 80% of the overall savings. And in part, this was because these particular sites started from a fairly efficient lighting baseline already. They already had some lighting controls in place. So here we've got the total project cost broken out between the lighting component of the project, the plug load integration component, and the HVAC component. So the big takeaway, obviously, is that lighting costs really dominate the overall project costs, and there's a relatively small cost associated with the HVAC controls integration. But it has, as you saw in the previous slide, a big impact on the energy savings results. So that can really reduce the payback on your investment in a more advanced lighting system. We concluded that the savings were really too low from the addition of the plug load controls to justify the additional cost. So focusing on that lighting and HVAC integration should be your best opportunity uh, for impact. The other thing I'll note about these Minnesota site costs, all in the total cost was around 650 a square foot across these, these sites. And most of that cost, as I said, was for the lighting. We've seen data with much lower installed costs for similar lighting products, those luminaire level lighting controls, in other parts of the country where energy efficiency programs have been actively promoting these projects and offering incentives, doing contractor education. So with those kinds of market transformation efforts in place, those markets see installed costs for similar systems more like 450 a square foot um, or even below. So that's something to consider depending where you're doing this kind of project. So now we want to look at payback and let's assume we can get that lower installed cost on lighting closer to what we've seen in the Pacific Northwest studies. And looking only at the lighting component of the project first on that first row, um, the cost per square foot around 450 and then still quite a long payback given the level of uh, 
reduction in lighting energy use, as we said, was pretty small because they were starting from a more efficient baseline. Now, when you add in the full uh, components of the project, the HVAC and plug load control, you can see that payback drop significantly. And if you focused on the most cost effective opportunities and just look at the lighting and HVAC, then your payback drops even further. And if you layer in some incentives, then you're getting around a five year payback, which can be tolerable for certain types of, of building owners. You also want to be thinking about what other value streams can this more advanced lighting system deliver? Uh, so we've talked about the system integration with other building controls. Uh, you can also look at other capabilities delivered by these kinds of lighting products like space utilization, asset tracking, demand response. And you can also think about it as a way to future proof your building. By installing one of these more advanced systems today, you open the door for potential future integrations which could have value. So let's just take a scenario here. If you layer on a space utilization benefit, um, then you can see the payback drop down to two years. And here we assumed that by using data from the lighting system on how your space is being utilized, you can actually maybe get rid of some space like an unused conference room. Um, let's say you reduce your overall rented square footage by half a percent. Well, that delivers a pretty impressive impact on your payback. Um, and that's because the high cost of space is order of magnitude higher than the cost of energy. So sm relatively small reduction in space can have a big impact on your overall investment. And then the other thing, of course, that comes into play is what are your energy costs? So the payback on our Minnesota sites was just over five years after incentives. In other markets where uh, electricity and gas prices are higher, then you can shorten payback further. Pat, take it away. Yeah, so now we'll go into um, some of the lessons that we learned about how to implement one of these uh, pilots. Um, well, specifically, uh, how to implement a integrated controls project. Um, a few just basic lessons learned before we dive into some of the, the process. Um, first of all, uh, cybersecurity uh, will often come into play because this involves networking multiple systems together, so involve IT early in the process. Um, second point is to really try to foster collaboration, especially between the lighting and the HVAC sides of the table, um, certainly IT as well, but lighting and HVAC uh, retrofits often happen um, in a completely separate uh, manner. Those trades don't always uh, need to um, collaborate or coordinate, but in this case they will. And it's important that um, any issues get sorted out together by both parties. So we'll talk throughout about making sure that there's, there's good collaboration. Um, on a similar, in a similar way, we, we need to make sure that physically and spatially the lighting and HVAC zoning um, work together and match up. Um, and then finally, uh, you want to make sure that you have a comprehensive set of HVAC control strategies to maximize savings. Don't just um, set back the thermostat by a couple degrees and assume you're going to get the order of magnitude savings that Claire just showed. Um, you need to capture a number of those measures that we talked about. Next slide. So let's go through the steps a little bit and we'll talk uh, at each step about some of the lessons that we learned in our five projects. Um, first step um, is a planning step. Um, <clears throat> you know, this is a, a little bit more than a typical, you know, simple lighting retrofit. So it, it will involve some planning. Um, first step is probably to do an economic assessment and just make sure you understand what you're getting out of the, um, uh, out of the project. Um, plan the project the way you would, you know, another retrofit. And then again, address cybersecurity, especially if you have specific cybersecurity protocols that um, systems or retrofits need to meet. Um, this is a great step to get a integration manager involved. Um, the integration manager could be, uh, could come from, you know, anywhere. It could be somebody who works for the owner. Um, if you're, if this is a uh, energy um, service contract, it could be a member of the ESCO. Um, if this is being completed by you, uh, or being heavily supported by utility program, it could be technical assistance from the utility program or it could be um, part of one of the contractors, but somebody needs to 
be in charge of making sure that these systems are going to integrate properly and making sure those two sides are talking and, and connecting and troubleshooting. Next slide. So in terms of assessing whether a building is a good fit or not, um, certainly you can do a little bit more in-depth economic assessment and Claire is going to go into um, you know, touch later on some tools that, that we have that can help you with that. But uh, some of the basics, you know, consider the building type. Um, we found that, again, this was actually pretty applicable across a wide set of building types. Um, we tested in office, healthcare, um, public buildings, and education, but uh, it should potentially work well in other building types as well. Um, in terms of lighting, obviously, the less efficient your lighting system, the better the payback is going to be on the system. Um, we tested in buildings that were largely already fluorescent or that were largely still fluorescent, but I think some of the less efficient LED systems, tubular LEDs may still pay back. The next one is, is a really important one. The building automation system that controls the HVC system does need to have some type of open protocol that can communicate with the lighting system. Um, the best bet is for to use BACnet, which is an open protocol that a lot of systems, including lighting systems, use. Um, but you also may be able to get by with an API uh, or other um, <clears throat> method of, of communication. In terms of HVAC, uh, a lot of common HVAC types um, are possible. The one thing I would say we've identified to avoid would be if you have a larger system that serves a lot of zones with just one thermostat. So sometimes you see in certain office buildings, you'll have a rooftop unit that serves like eight private offices all in the same thermostat. Systems like that, um, it's harder to do that granular control. They don't tend to work as well. Um, but a lot of HVAC systems, heat pump systems, those zone-based systems work well. And then the bigger the, the, the project, the better the payback is going to be because there are some comp fixed costs with the complexity. Next slide. And you can click again. <clears throat> so moving beyond planning to design, um, this is where we're going to actually go in and, and design our system ahead of time, especially with the lighting elements. <clears throat> Excuse me. And there is some some design to be done here. Again, this is not quite as simple as a one for one swap out. You can go to the next slide, Claire. So you are going to do a lighting design. Now this should be a very simple lighting design because you should be able to take the existing um, lighting design for the space and simply denote new fixtures in all of the locations. In fact, we highly recommend that you keep it a one for one um retrofit in terms of the uh fixture replacement try not to adjust the ceiling at all if you can i mean certainly going from a two by four to a two by two might be a reasonably simple ceiling adjustment but hopefully you can do these projects without touching the ceiling much because that adds a lot of additional cost and the ability to tune and control these fixture by fixture really allows you to to do that you don't need to worry about overlighting the space because you can task tune um, it's important to do a site visit and really understand these spaces. Um, and while you're doing the site visit, talk to as many people as you can because you're going to be controlling these zones. Um, again, you're not just doing a fixture swap out. Um, you're going to want to control things like um, the timeout um, on the occupancy, the light level, how much you control the HVAC by, and talking to people and understanding how the space is used and what their tolerance level is, is a really good step. <laughs> Next slide. Beyond that, that you know, basic lighting design, lighting layout, which I think is pretty common to all projects, you're going to need to do a little bit more design work on the control elements. Here, we highly recommend doing a matrix by space. Um, sometimes you can actually go down to individual spaces, you know, room 101, room 102, but sometimes you can do as as shown here and do it by space type. So all the private offices are all going to be the same, etc. And, and you want to denote things like uh, the control mode. Is it occupancy or vacancy? Um, the occupancy timeout. Again, how long are we going to wait before we shut everything off when people leave? And that depends a little bit on tolerance. You want to push that as low as you can from an energy standpoint, but you do not want to inconvenience people. If they're coming in and out of spaces often, um, you may need to raise that a bit. And then task tuning percentage. The task tuning percentage, uh, you see a calculation in the upper right corner, target illuminance versus calcul calculated illuminance. 
Ideally, you want to use a target illuminance from something like an IES reference. Um, and you want to take your calculated illuminance, um, ideally from doing some calculations or modeling ahead of time, doing basically doing photometrics. That way, when you get into the space, you can just automatically tune the light to 75% or 85% or whatever. Um, alternatively, you could get in the space and do some light level measurements with a photo, photo sensor, but that takes more time. So do some photometrics if you can. Next slide. So that covers the lighting design. On the HVAC side, um, there is also a need to do some design, but it's really just developing control sequences. So there aren't really a need to develop a significant set of drawings, for example. Um, for our project to simplify control sequences, we took our sequences, at least to start, from ASHRAE Guideline 36, which is a library of standardized control sequences. I think you're going to see um, uh, in an increasing way that contractors um, have experience with Guideline 36, and if you tell them that's what you want, they can implement it using some existing work that they've done. Um, Though that, that's going to take some time. It's, we're still at a point where not every contractor has seen Guideline 36 before. Um, this just shows one snippet from Guideline 36, an example of how to control that VAV box flow, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but all of the measures that I described at the, up at the top of the presentation are covered in, in Guideline 36. Um, you probably need to designate somebody to do a actual a control sequence design here. Um, an engineer is going to have to get involved. In order to save cost, you probably could go with a design build controls contractor, um, especially if you already have a controls contractor that ser services this building and has already done some retrofit work or improved your, your controls before. They're familiar with the building. Um, maybe you even have a prearranged service contract with them. That's a great way to go as opposed to going to necessarily an independent design firm, but you can certainly have an independent design firm work up a design as well. We even had one site that completed the work in-house because it was a big campus and they had that capability. So um, utilize existing relationships if you have them. Next step. Next slide. <clears throat> and then finally, plug loads. You want to think a little bit about which plug loads you're going to con control. Um, plug load control is the least expensive of the three but it still uh, costs uh, in integration labor per point. So every plug load control that you put in, you need to integrate it with the system, and that costs you in the labor time it takes to do that integration. So you can't control every single outlet. It's too expensive. Um, so you want to identify workstations that are heavily loaded, that have a lot of task lights, monitors, heaters, and fans. Um, you could potentially do furniture feeds that lead into you know, if you do, if you have cubicles, it's common for them to be fed by a couple different circuits. You could simply control one of the circuits that feeds those cubicles and hit a bunch of outlets with one uh, control point. Um, printers and copiers are good. Computer labs have a lot of load. Uh, beverage equipment that includes um, both uh, uh, coffee makers to make sure they're on off overnight, as well as um, water coolers. And then fitness equipment. We had some treadmills and so forth in our fitness center that we were able to control. So identify those things ahead of time, um, denote them on your plan, and uh, be selective with your plug loads. Next slide. With all three of these elements, we do need to have one drawing that shows how the zones are going to be set up. Now, the zones can be different between um, lighting and HVAC. Often you have more granular lighting control zones than you do HVAC zones. Um, that would be one possible uh, outcome. But it's also possible that they're all one for one, that each lighting zone and plug load zone and HVAC zone is, is identical. In any case, you need to lay that out and understand uh, how those pieces fit together. Um, you can't, for example, uh, in some with some lighting products, cut a lighting zone in half and control one half of, uh, sorry, have a lighting zone be two separate HVAC zones. That often will not work. In some cases, it will. It depends on the product you have. You just need to be aware of how, how you are able to zone your system. But make sure you have a map in any case. Next slide. 
And then the last step is construction. So hopefully we've done a really nice job laying out those elements in design. So it's very clear what our lighting contract, our electrical contractor is going to do and what our mechanical control and or controls contractor is going to do. And that should make the construction process pretty straightforward. But we do have a few lessons learned here that we can share with you. Um, first of all, again, if you can make uh, the fixture replacement one for one, that's going to make construction much, much easier. So do that wherever you can. Um, within the system, once you're programming both the lighting and the HVAC, and you need the two to be talking to each other, it helps a lot if the space names that you use in the programming are very meaningful. Um, if the space name on the lighting side is some meaningless alphanumeric string, it's going to be really hard for the HVAC side to understand what they're seeing. So um, act accordingly. Uh, if possible, use a controls contractor that's already really familiar with the building. Um, this is a retrofit. Existing buildings have video syncrasies. That helps. Um, and then finally, lay out a really clear scope of work for the different pieces uh, or the different roles. Uh, that way you don't have the um, uh, lighting designer feeling that they need to handle uh, a lot of work on the building automation system because maybe that's covered by the um, uh, controls contractor. Or maybe the vendor, the um, lighting manufacturer, handles the commissioning of the lighting system. That actually happened in a number of our buildings. Uh, if that's the case, make sure that the electrical contractor doesn't put commissioning in their scope or you'll end up with uh, a lot of confusion. Next step. Um, interacting with the occupants. This is really important because with this retrofit, you're changing how systems that the occupants use every day is controlled. So educate them. Um, on the far on the right side here, you see a handout that we used to describe to people how their outlets are going to be controlled. Um, this will reduce complaints and make sure that the savings persist because when things don't work the way people think they're going to, sometimes they'll just shut the controls off. Um, and in a lot of cases, it's really helpful for them to just know that uh, this is why something's shutting off. Like they, they may not mind if something's off as long as they know why it's off. Um, also take particular care with light levels, printer availability, and then how long it takes for the temperature to recover in a space. So those are three areas to focus on. Next slide. So in with the systems that we used, the lighting system was uh, lighting control system was entirely wireless, and that helped a lot with retrofit because we didn't have to run wires everywhere. And I think you're going to find that's possible with almost all lighting product lines now. They're all set up to do this wirelessly, which is great. But there is one wire that needs that we needed to in install in every project, and that was between the lighting system and the HVC system. And you can see here just an, ex um, an example of how our network was set up in most cases. Now you see here that we connected to the facility IT network in a couple cases, but you see that that's optional. You can, in some cases, connect directly to the build and automation system without going through IT. Uh, but next slide. We do recommend that you engage with IT and that you connect the system to the Internet. Um, we in an, on a couple projects. Uh, sort of attempted or at least talked about moving forward without making that connection to IT, the IT system and the Internet, and it presented all kinds of difficulties with updating firmware and software. Um, handling security and then doing remote access into the system to fix things. So highly recommend you just engage IT, connect to the Internet. Next slide. All right, so is the market ready to deliver these kinds of integrated controls retrofit projects? So last year we completed some supply chain market research in the Northeast to find out what lighting manufacturers, distributors, HVAC control contractors, and lighting installers and customers think of this kind of system integration approach. Uh, when we ask them about factors that would potentially motivate a project to happen, um, a number of the vendors noted that customers are interested in integrating controls as a way of streamlining or simplifying operations. 
What they ideally would want is a single display that allows them to monitor system performance and get fault detection. And that may not always be possible, especially in a retrofit scenario where you're integrating a new lighting system with existing HVAC controls. But it is more feasible in a new construction context where you can plan um, an integrated system from the outset. And there are some products on the market that can deliver that kind of integration through a single platform. Um, in terms of other factors that motivate, you know, sustainability, energy savings, what you would expect um, to see. Then when we asked about what kind of barriers there are to the approach to this approach, we got a lot of answers that pertain to informational barriers. Everything from lack of building owner awareness to uh, lack of contractor awareness. There's too many different lighting products on the market. It's hard to figure out what's going to be easier or harder to integrate. Um, these projects seem complex, you know, hard to find somebody that's qualified to do the work. All of those things came up. So lots of informational barriers, um, probably even a bigger factor than, than potentially the cost barriers and economics. So then when we ask about, well, how could energy efficiency programs support these kinds of projects and, and make them easier to happen? Um, of course, incentives were mentioned frequently, but getting at those informational barriers, education, training, technical assistance, all of those were mentioned as really important programmatic elements to get this to work. Um, as we've continued to work uh, to identify more demonstration sites in the Northeast, uh, a few other challenges have come to the fore. So in markets where you have really high saturation of LEDs, that business case for a luminaire level lighting control system uh, gets a little bit harder to make. So potentially in the future, could there be some system integration solutions developed for customers at sites that have already upgraded to LEDs, or maybe you're just replacing those first generation LEDs with a better system, as Scott mentioned. Um, and then the question is, you know, what kinds of service providers are really going to drive uptake of this approach? Um, I would say we got the most interest from energy service companies, HVAC controls contractors, um, those kind of um, companies that are interested in kind of comprehensive uh, improvement across a building's operations. Um, we haven't seen as much uh, of a driver from the lighting side of the project, even though these kinds of projects could really improve the economics of a more advanced lighting system. So Slipstreams developed a number of resources, uh, which all of which are posted on our website to help address some of the informational barriers um, around integration of different controls. We have produced an implementation guide that provides detailed step-by-step -step guidance for each step of implementing this kind of project like we talked about today. We've also posted some case studies from the DOE project site. Uh, and we've developed a decision support tool or energy savings estimator to help a building owner decide if an integrated controls project might make sense for their building. So it's really quick and easy to use. You just enter some basic information about your building um, and the planned lighting retrofit project, and you can get a quick estimate of uh, electric and gas savings from implementing an integrated controls approach. And this is based on energy modeling that we've done here at Slipstream. We've also posted some shorter informational videos, including a short uh, clip on how to use the savings estimator tool. So we really thank you for your time today and don't hesitate to reach out if you'd like more information on this topic.